Good morning. <clears throat> I don't know if you all know my name, but it's Ed. And uh, for me, it's a privilege to be here. The pastor has graciously allowed me to step into his pulpit and uh, share the Word of God. And uh, for me, that's a little treat. I've been retired now for, what, two years? And uh, it gives me an, ex uh, an opportunity to exercise. <clears throat> now that movie trailer that we just seen starred Marlon Brando, and it was called The Ugly American. It was a fictional story that, that dealt with a very real perception of Americans overseas. It seems we were seen by many as ugly Americans. As I researched for this sermon, I discovered that all over the world, people have viewed American tourists and business people as being loud and arrogant, demanding and thoughtless, ignorant and intolerant of people who weren't like them. Now, is that true? Have we actually been ugly Americans? As much as I hate to say it, the answer is yes, we have. Too many Americans who've, who've traveled and lived abroad have behaved badly. So badly that the rest of our nation has been smeared by association. And it's easy to understand why these ugly Americans get ugly. They come from one of the most powerful nations on earth, so they think they're privileged or special or something. They think they're part of a country that has gotten it right militarily, industrially, and culturally. In short, they see themselves as the best people on this planet. They've got it all together and everybody else comes in second. So they feel they deserve to act like ugly Americans. In our passage this morning, God wants, warns us against being an ugly American kind of Christian. Someone who's arrogant and demanding, thoughtless and intolerant, and yeah, I have to include myself into that category. You know, all you have to do is look in the mirror to see an ugly Christian at times. I've been an ugly Christian more times than I care to admit. There's a Dr. Rubel Shelley uh, an author, minister, and a professor at Rochester College in Rochester, Mich Rochester Hills, Michigan. And he told of an incident surrounding the death of a man named Christopher Hitchens. This man had been a militant atheist, and he died of cancer in 2011. Now, you might have referred to him as an ugly atheist. He hated Christianity. And he would often use demeaning and abusive language with believers. This man engaged a, a number of Christian defenders, a, a no, number of apologists in debate, and in 2007 he even wrote a book called God is Not Great. And it became a bestseller. To me that's sad. But that's not the point of the story. You see, Hitchens developed throat cancer. And Shelley said that he followed some of the online comments made by churchgoers concerning his cancer. And, and these included a, range, a wide range of responses. You know, several exp expressed concern. Some offered hope for his recovery. And some were even praying for him. But then there were also comments like, how fitting, losing the throat that he used to blaspheme. 
or this one. This foul reprobate in the end, knowing he shall die, will beg for forgiveness. And I can't wait until the last little breath in his miserable body starts to fade. And then he will know if there's a God or not. And according to Shelley, others were even worse. Those are the mild ones. Sometimes, Christians can get ugly. They think they're doing God favors, but they're not. After he tells Christians how they should behave in this world, Peter tells us that we should behave in such a way that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. In fact, if, if we Christians are being petty, neither God nor Christian will receive any praise. It'll be voided out. God didn't save us to pass judgment. Not even on the worst of sinners. God saved us to be his missionaries to folks like Hitchens. And yes, it's true. Christopher Hitchens was a miserable, hate-filled guy who made the choice to reject God and despise believers. In reality, he must have been pretty much the same to a lot of other people as well. People who, like him, were not believers. But in the end, things weren't turning out very well for him, were they? And you know what? That shouldn't make us happy. God doesn't even need or want an ugly American kind of Christian. But he does tell us what he does want. He tells us to be alert and sober of mind so that we can pray. He wants us to love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. He wants us to offer hospitality to one another without grumbling and to use whatever gift we've received to serve others. When we speak, we should do so as one speaking the very words of God. And when we serve, we should do it with the strength God provides. In other words, God wants us to be good boys and girls. He wants us to be nice and pleasant to be around. And in order for us to be those kinds of nice people, God wants us to focus on the right things. So what does he want us to focus on? First, God wants us to be alert and sober and of sober mind. He's telling us to be clear-minded and self-controlled so that we can pray. That's the first thing on the list. Why is it first? Because it tells us that our responsibility is to focus on God. Number one is to focus on God because it tells us that's our command. One survey found that 70% of Americans say they pray every day. Now, how many of us really pray every day? Don't respond. Just think about it. So 70% of Americans say they pray every day. But a scholar named Albert Moeller read a study, read that study, and here's his observation. Quote, the impression left by the total package is of a nation that increasingly embraces soft and self-centered forms of spirituality, even as it rejects more demanding forms of belief. They see spirituality as a means of self-development 
They want to get in touch with the universe and with their inner selves, but are not particularly concerned to know what the Creator would demand of them, unquote. In other words, these folks pray to have God, do, God to do things for them, not the other way around. Peter writes, be clear-minded. Don't allow your mind to be distracted by the things of this world. Don't just pray about what you want. Pray about what God wants. Then he writes, be self-controlled. Bend your will to God's will. Clear your mind and and." And bend your will so that you'll pray as you should. If you do these two things, you'll be able to pray in the right way. It's then that you lay hold of God's power and guidance in your life. But if you don't do that, you'll end up spiritually bankrupt. Imagine being overseas on a trip. You've had a couple of great days of sightseeing, you know. It's, going places is nice. Going to see things is great. But then you find that somebody's stolen your wallet. All your credit cards, all your cash is gone. It's all you had, and now you have nothing. You're flat broke. What are you going to do? Well, I might pout. I might even cry. Then I get frustrated and I get mad. But I will eventually get to the point where I contact my bank or some finance, financial institution to get some money because if I don't have money, I'm in serious trouble. I have to do what I can to make contact with someone who will help me. That's what prayer is all about. We're strangers and aliens in this land without access to our resources. We can't survive here without the proper resources, and prayer is our connection to those resources. So it's extremely important that we be clear-minded and self-controlled so that we can pray as we should. So first, we need to tap into God's bank account by praying in the right way. Secondly, we need to love people. We need to be people of love. First Peter 4.8 tells us, above all, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. Did you get that? Love covers a multitude of sins. Why would love need to cover a multitude of sins? Are we sinful? Sometimes. It's because Christians aren't always the easiest people to live with. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So sometimes we're hard to get along with. Just ask my wife. Sometimes when we come to church, we Christians are like a bunch of porcupines who huddle together to keep warm. Can you imagine what that's like? Try to visualize that. Would you like to hug a, hug a porcupine today? Hmm. They say the world is round, and yet I often think it's square. So many little hurts we get from corners here and there. But there's one truth in life I've found while journeying east and west, that only folks we really wound are those we love the best. We flatter those we scarcely know. We please the fleeting guest and deal a many thoughtless blows to those 
we love the best. Now that poem isn't specifically dealing with the church, but the lesson from it seems to describe how many churches work. People tend to be the most thoughtless to those who are closest to them. Likewise, Christians tend to learn to treat others in their lives by the way they treat who is closest to them, even on Sunday morning. We Christians learn by doing and by loving, but it's, it's what we practice with each other that makes the difference. It's what we practice that's going to come out of us. And loving isn't just an emotion. One man put a twist on the words of Jesus that are found in Luke 7, 47. And he, he read them like this. How much, or he who loves much, does much. He who loves much, does much. The guy who doesn't do anything for others can talk about love all day long. But if he's all talk, he's just kidding himself. God's not deceived, and neither are others. In John, 1 John 3, 17, God tells us, If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need, but he has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and in truth. Shouldn't we be doing something? Shouldn't we be in action? Let's not just sit in these chairs and think that's enough. Because it's not. In verses 9 through 11, Paul tells us how we should love. Offer hospitality. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each one of us should use whatever gift he has received to serve others. Faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, he should do it as one speaking the very words of God. Have you ever thought about that? How often during the, the work week do you think that my voice, what I say, is speaking the very words of God? Puts a little different twist on what we're going to say, doesn't it? If anyone serves, he should do it with the strength that God provides. Because in our own strength, we're going to fail. You see, Peter's telling us to find ways to serve each other, to speak encouraging words to each other, and to show hospitality. Church can be a great place to learn about God. It's kind of like a, a miniature Bible college. You know, we have all these different uh, classes about the Bible, and we, we take different books, and we learn uh, what this particular author has to say about God and the Bible and of Jesus Christ, or maybe the way we should be living and acting. But Jesus meant the church to be a lot more than just that. The church is to be a laboratory, or laboratory, some people call it a laboratory. But the church is to be a laboratory. Christians train each other in ministry. And they train each other how to do love. How to do love. That's what Hebrews 10 talks about where it says, let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. This church, the church, should be a training ground for all of us. Here in the church is where we should learn how to treat those 
who are outside the church. Here is where we learn to serve each other inside the church. Here is where we learn to serve others outside the church. Let me share a little story with you. A group of preachers were studying together. And one of them said he, had a, he was puzzled by something. And he said, what's this about? The end of all things is near, therefore... That's First Peter 4, 7. Peter just launches into a laundry list of, of how we should show love. And the response he received was a well-used cliche. One of those preachers said, whenever you see a therefore in the Bible, you need to find out what the therefore is there for. And that is so true. So the question is, why would Peter tell us the end of all things is near? It's been almost 2,000 years since he walked the earth. And why would he tell us the rest of all this stuff that we've heard today? As I thought about this, and as I answer, searched for an answer, I found myself reading a story that Jesus told in Luke 12. Suppose the servant says to himself, my master is taking a long time in coming. And he then begins to beat the men servants and the maid servants and to eat and drink and get drunk. The master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him or at an hour he is not aware of. He will cut him to pieces and assign him to a place with unbelievers. What Jesus was saying is if you become my servant, don't go around abusing my people. Your Christian brothers and sisters belong to me and I'll take it personally if you treat, mistreat them. The end of all things is near and I'm coming back. And when I come back, if you have been abusing my people in any way, you and I are going to have a little talk. And you won't like the outcome of that discussion. Yes, I've seen ugly Christians, believers who run roughshod, who've trampled over others. <coughs> and why did they do it? because they felt they had the right to do so. They thought they were holier than thou, higher than them, more knowledgeable, better theology. And when, I, and when Jesus comes back, I wouldn't want to be in their shoes. As they say, not for all the tea in China. And I like Chinese tea. So what am I trying to say? It's this. If you decide to get mad at someone, one of your brothers or sisters in Christ, be very careful how you treat them. I'm just saying. The end of all things is at hand. And you don't want to get caught in the middle of a feud when Jesus comes back. The Corinthian church had a problem like that. They were always at each other's throats. They argued about who was the most important, about who had the best gifts. They argued about legal matters, spiritual matters, and marital matters. They argued constantly about everything. And this argumentative and uncaring attitude carried over into their worship. Apparently they tried to mimic the Passover feast. You know, the one that Jesus had on the night he was betrayed. They had a meal first and, and then took communion. 
Their meal consisted of a potluck dinner. Who likes potluck dinners? I know the pastor likes potluck dinners. And I do too. It was one of my favorite things when I was pastoring, especially when it comes to red velvet cake. I think he has a, a, a favorite too. But so they go to this potluck dinner. But their potluck dinner was a little bit different than our potluck dinners. When you went to their potlucks, if you didn't have a pot, you were out of luck. And that's the way it was. Some folks would show up with meat and potatoes and others would arrive with pea soup and they ate what they brought. No one shared with anyone else. They refused to show love to each other in their fellowship. And then they'd take communion together? What's up with that? So Paul tells them, you've sinned against each other, and there have been consequences. He says, don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Or you do, do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? A man ought to examine himself before he eats the bread and drinks the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. That's why so many among you are weak and sick and a number of you have fallen asleep. Their lack of love for each other led to physical sickness and actual death. I think God was being very clear. It's as though he's, he's saying to us, I'm not messing around here. Love one another. And when I say love one another, I mean it. So this is serious business. This love one another thing is crucial to our identity and to our existence. And I might add, we must always keep focused on the fact that love is the most powerful tool we have. Because what is God but love? If we take it seriously, we can change the world around us. Rochester, New York had, and maybe it still does, but once upon a time it had the unique reputation. Um, back in 1940, Rochester was the first city named the friendliest city in America. And they won the, the contest again in 1994. And as recently as 2010, Forbes.com rated 100 of the U.S. largest cities and found Rochester, New York, to be one of the friendliest and one of the best places to raise a family. Struck me as odd. But a researcher was impressed by that and wondered why the city had such a long history of friendliness. And what he discovered took him back to the year 1829. Back then, Rochester was known as the gateway to the west, a boisterous rough town of that time. And that same year, a daredevil named Sam Patch arrived in the city and announced that he'd be diving from the heights of the local falls into the foaming waters below. You know, in a day where there were no movies or TV or no internet or cell phones, that was a big thing. I mean, this was really big stuff. Well, the day arrived, and thousands of locals assembled to watch this man defy death. But he didn't defy death. He dove from the cliffs as advertised, but apparently he lost his balance in the process, and with his arms twirling madly, he struck the churning waters below. Minutes passed, and he didn't resurface. 
And the audience waited in silence as they watched for him to come up out of the water on the shores below, but he never appeared. In time, the crowd began to break up and the people went home in shock. The man's body was found and discovered in the ice the following spring. But on that Sunday morning, two days after Patch's fatal jump, <clears throat> a prominent businessman named Josiah Bissell went to the front of his church and he declared that all who by their presence encouraged that soul to leap into eternity would be held accountable on the judgment day. Grief swept through that church and people openly wept. But Bissell wasn't finished. Being a wealthy man, he sent for Charles Finney, a prominent evangelist of that day. He promised to pay Finney's expenses for six months if he'd come to Rochester and change the heart of that city. Finney met with and confronted various groups within the, within the uh, city. And... Uh, He convicted them of their need of Jesus and his forgiveness. He stressed the importance of reaching out to others for the sake of God's love for them. And the result was an entirely convicted community and a city determined to dedicate itself to good deeds and charity. And I believe that decision still influences the generations that have followed in that city. Among the outcomes of that day of conviction came the following. The city experienced a boom in churches being built. They set up a public school system in 1813. They established a university in 1850. Numerous charities sprung up. The prison system was revamped with a major overhaul, and the city became the central in the fight to abolish slavery. Rochester was, was a station on the Underground Railroad during the Civil War. My point is this. People who are driven by nothing more than self-entertainment and attempts to avoid boredom may feel grief. But they remain unchanged in the midst of tragedy. Unchanged. But once confronted by the message of Jesus and the power of, of, of loving and caring for others, a society can be transformed and can even shake their world. And that's exactly what God is saying to Christians in 1 Peter 4. Don't just exist in this world. Be transformed by the power of Christ and make a difference by the Savior you love. Would you stand with me? Listen to these words. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be clear-minded and self-controlled so that you can pray. And above all, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each one of us should use whatever gift we've received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, he should do it as one speaking the very words of God. If anyone serves, he should do it with the strength God provides so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. You are dismissed.